Hi, everybody, and welcome to this um, event at MMCs. Uh, we are a little bit late, so I will try to uh, wrap up very quickly this introduction and then leave the floor to this um, amazing line of, line of speakers that we have today. So first, let me say that uh, I, I care a lot about these events because since 2019, we started to really have a lot of have to put even more efforts than usual in, in the aspect of equality, diversity and inclusion. So just give me, I wanted just to give you a little bit of overview on what we do and what we try to achieve in MMCs. So uh, we really try to collect uh, or offer support that can help minorities and uh, less privileged attendees to be able to enter our community and join our community. So that's something that we really try to, to do every year. We also uh, care a lot about all the possible gender balance and minorities that we do have in, uh, in the conferences, in the organizations, in the, in also the attendees and every aspect of the, of the population, let's say, uh, of the MMC's community. And also uh, since last year, uh, we provide also support for people that need help. So last year we had childcare and this year we have carer support. So it's similar in the sense of it's still some funding that really try to allow everybody to join the conference and attend this, the conference. So this is something that we feel is really important. We will talk more about opportunities and, and what we can do more. So this is why we have these uh, speakers today. Um, just a little bit of numbers. So we provide 10 student travel grants uh, seven diversity travel grants, EDI travel grants, and two career awards this year, which is already good since uh, it's an library event and not everybody's there. So we really try to uh, provide most of the support. And I think we will also hear the 25 by 25 and uh, uh, hopefully we are beyond. I don't know, that's a little bit maybe provocative, but we really, uh, we really, feel that balancing and it's very important in our communities. So last year we already have uh, one general chair that was female. This year we have also another one that is uh, a, an excellent representative of um, female population. We also have uh, a quite large percentage of, uh, of women involved in the whole uh, OC from the main conference to the workshops and also in the session chair. So it's something that we really take very seriously. And we took very seriously also the invitation of the speakers that we hope you will enjoy and will increase even more the awareness about the topic. Uh, the schedule is a little bit late, so don't look at the schedule. Uh, I will maybe introduce uh, uh, the first two speakers now because uh, uh, are the ones that are going to talk now. And then the rest, I will introduce it uh, step by step while we go along the way. Uh, just one quick comment. So please put all your questions in the ask a question bu uh, chat button that you have in the live streaming. It's a little bit unusual, but we will have all the question session at the end. So we'll try to have some space for the question at the end, because we hope that will kind of be a sort of uh, discussions that we can have with the speakers today. So that's why you will see that we have no uh, time for the question after each speakers. Today, uh, let's start with uh, Miriam Ridai and Susan Ball. Uh, they will present uh, uh, towards a more equitable, inclusive multimedia community and uh, 25 by 25 towards better gender equality within SIGMM. So Miriam is a senior research scientist at Wikimedia Foundation, also a visiting research fellow at King's College and a conference director at SIGMM. So it would be very interesting to hear from her. And Susan Ball is a full professor for media informatics and multimedia system at University of Edinburgh and a member of the um, Institute for Information and Technology. And she also has a very active role as SIGMM and SIGKAI um, community. And especially uh, she is the SIGMM director of diversity and outreach and the SIGA, SIGKAI uh, VIP conferences. So thanks again. And I leave the floor to you. Okay, so Miriam and Susan, you are free to. I am share my screen. Do you see my presentation? If, if I don't hear, I, I'm assuming you see my presentation. Yeah, okay. yes. Okay. Yeah, that's it, cool. All right, so uh, thank you, Laura, for this nice presentation. And thank you for the invitation. I 
really wish I could be there in person with you, but unfortunately the United Kingdom has decided to move Turkey out of the Red List too late, and so I'm stuck in my apartment in London. Um, <laughs> I want to also thank um, uh, Laura and the organizers of this workshop for um, putting energy into this cause. We really need it as a community and as a members of the technology community as a whole. So thank you very much and thank you MNCs for promoting this initiative. So um, what I'm here to do today is to tell you a bit about the new ICM Sigma Executive Committee and what our current and future goals towards diversity and inclusion are. Um, so this is as Alberto is a professor at the University of Florence. He's a Sigmund chair, uh, Phoebe from uh, Lafford University in Australia is a vice chair, and then there is me. Um, we started our mandate less than three months ago. So what you're going to see today is really a uh, work in progress. And what I would really like to stress is that we want to hear your feedback about the uh, initiatives that we have in mind and the uh, initiative that we need to do because we want these um, processes to reflect what actually the community wants. So um, I'm here also to hear your feedback um, since we have all of us just started in this role. So if you've been to the SIGMM website uh, recently, you've seen that we uh, have put a welcome message from the chairs and there are a bunch of things, but our main commitment is to make the multimedia research community even more inclusive, important and present worldwide. This means growing the community, not only in terms of numbers, but really in terms of the audiences that we can reach and the underrepresented group that we want to now be represented in our community. So there are a bunch of um, uh, goals for our, our mandate. And here I want to talk about the more diversity and inclusion related points that are um, in, in, in our message. And there are mainly three, openness, inclusion of underrepresented groups and gender balance in our roles. So the first one is openness and while the link between openness and inclusion might not be so intuitive, I can tell you I come from um, a movement, a free knowledge movement, which is the Wikimedia and the Wikipedia movement. And I've seen how open science, open knowledge, open software and open data really lower down the entry barriers for uh, people around the world to become part of our community, um, uh, our communities. And um, because not everybody can afford proprietary science and proprietary software and proprietary code. So it's very important to keep encouraging openness. I have to say as a community, we are doing pretty well in terms of open science. We leave our, our papers open for one year after the proceedings are published. Um, there are in at MNCs ACL multimedia tracks for open data and open software. We want to keep nurturing this, this initiative and even creating new ones. Um, and again, we have some ideas on how to improve the openness of our research. Um, but we want to hear from you if you have experience on this aspect, um, um, if, if you have suggestions on how to make this happen. The second point is about inclusion, and this is a workshop about inclusion, so I don't think I have to really explain what we're talking about here, but um, our understanding of inclusion is really in the broadest sense. And um, uh, more specifically, we, we want to really um, include underrepresented groups and historically marginalized people into our community. So what we have been done so far, and this is just a start, is to have the um, just travel schemes, what, what Laura was talking about before, to offer travel schemes. Um, and in particular, we have two travel schemes. This is a screenshot of a tweet from our ACM SIGMM account. And let me thank Sylvia for being the voice of uh, SIGMM on, um, on social media. Without her, basically, we, we wouldn't be able to reach a lot of people. Um, so there are two main... Um, um, uh, travel grants. The first one is the Sigma Student Travel Grant. Um, that basically, actually, what is for is for uh, live conferences. So, Sigma is the first. Uh, sorry, MMCs is the first conference where we can actually we could actually give these these grants for obvious reasons because for a while we didn't have um, 
live conferences uh, or in-person conferences. And the second uh, grant is the CARE Award that also Laura mentioned and is about um, um, reimbursing, Sigmund reimburses um, people who attend online conferences and they have um, caring duties for children or loved ones. So these um, the, the expenses for these caring duties, they're reimbursed by CMM. So these two travel grants, um, they are for Sigma members only. Uh, this means that people have to pay $15 to become Sigma members in order to access these grants. And uh, all Sigma sponsored conferences can benefit from these grants and they each conference has their, their deadline. And then there is a steering committee of each grant that takes care of um, uh, approving the applications. Some budget stuff that we can skip. Um, I think one important um, thing for the student travel scheme is that we want to uh, hear from the people who receive these grants, uh, hear their opinion about the, um, the conferences they have attended. So we require a short report of the conference to be published in the SIGMM records, which is the SIGMM record is really a quarterly snapshot of the state is uh, the state of our community, and I want to just thank Pablo for for giving a lot of love to the Sigmund records in the past few years, because it's a really an amazing resource we have. Um, so travel grants, I think they're great, but there are many more um, initiatives that we could bring forward, and especially um, when we think about inclusion in its broader sense, we we really have in mind reaching audiences that we are not reaching at the moment. Multimedia research is expensive. The, the, the resources for multimedia computing, they are very expensive, the computational power, and not, not everyone can afford that. Not every institution can afford that. Not every uh, country can afford that. And so we want to promote an initiative to support these under-resourced countries and people with financial difficulties. We haven't done much so far. We have just started. And again, if you have ideas on how to do this, we want to hear your feedback. And the last point is about gender balance in our roles. Um, I am going to leave it to Suzanne to talk about the initiatives in this, on, on this um, point. I think um, having gender balance is in our um, attendance at the conferences, I think is, is absolutely great. Having gender balance in the senior membership of our community is equally important. And if I have to say one reason is just so ju junior people can look at the senior members and self-identify with senior members and get somehow inspired. So uh, thank you, Suzanne, for all the initiatives you have done throughout the years and on and, and, and improving gender balance in our community. One of these is the 25 by 25 initiatives. And I am going to uh, stop here and leave it to Suzanne, who is going to tell us about this initiative as a SIGMA Director of Diversity and Outreach. Suzanne, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, that, what a wonderful transition um, to my presentation. Um, my name is uh, Susanne Boll. I'm a, a researcher uh, at the corner between multimedia and human computer interaction. And um, I'm a member of the SIGMM community, I could say for decades. So that's quite some time. And the question is, um, um, as, a, as a young researcher, I was already um, convinced I can go everywhere, I can achieve everything. And over the decades, I found out that there <coughs> is obstacles in my way. And some of them re relate to um, the discrimination and also to a lacking gender equality and diversity in my research communities and my research environments. Um, so I, let, me, let me start with um, the reason uh, why actually I'm so much also passionate for this. So gender equality is absolutely one element of diversity. It's not replacing it in any way. It doesn't have like a specific focus, but it was my authentic story. You know, I was a woman in computer science very early years. It was always, always the only one or only a few one and so on. So what we really need to understand is that gender equality is um, something it concerns all of us. You know, it's not like only the concern of um, of a fraction of people, you know, it's it's uh, concerning us as a society. 
And in this case, uh, with SIG Multimedia, it is also part of our image. So we need to understand that this is not on um, helping individual people <clears throat> or respecting individual people. It's also about the values that we have as a community. And this is why I, uh, I was and am still passionate about it. And so the history is that we actually had um, facts on the table. So um, there was an initial report <coughs> um, uh, in which um, one six started collecting data and um, SIGMM continued that, what was on the SIG ARC community. And then the executive chair, I hope you don't hear that. I think we have a construction in the building. Sorry for that. So um, in 2018, Alan also took over as an East, uh, executive committee chair uh, to really collect the facts. So there was a report, Gender Diversity in SIGMM, we just leave this here as well, which was published. So we really looked at the fact. It was not such like a feeling of someone. So to make sure that we are looking at the numbers and we want to work on this. And then, um, I have um, taken over the new role as a SIGMM Director of Diversity and Outreach, Outreach, and I think that was not only a position. I was um, discussing this uh, with Alan at that time, and I was also um, more or less making clear it should not and it cannot be just a role that is like a decoration now. So now the Executive Committee has this new role and they got, she's going to handle it and then let's say don't bother the rest of us so it was clear it should be a voting member of the executive committee which is a sign in itself and also um i was preparing a strategic document um, which was discussed and decided on and i think that is an, an important element so it's it needs to come to a point where um equity gender equality diversity and inclusion become I would call a strategic goal of an institution. It's not a nice to have thing. And in this 25 and 25 strategy, we were just looking at the facts. So in many panels, in many organizations, it was not even, let's say 5%, 10%. <laughs> so of course it would be nice to have a 50% um, representation, but at least sort of we wanted to start something. So the goal is to increase the participation of women in all activities and committees of SIGMM at least to 25% by the year 2025. And um, this is not so easy to achieve, and I'll share you a little bit uh, about this. And the idea was that it has to come with all of our rules, all of our <clears throat> strategic goals. So there are several actions which reach or range from executive actions, like who should be on a steering committee, how many female, uh, how many women should be on a, on a steering committee, but also on all our events, you know, what are the conferences we run, what does the organizational committees have, what, how does the keynote inv inv invitations have been made, and, and what kind of diversity and gender distribution do we see there. So there was a lot of um, number of actions, um, which we are currently implementing towards that goal in 2025. The question you could ask, you know, did it help? Um, and I said, yes, even though the facts and figures um, are not, let's say, extremely um, perfect by now, it's now like we are almost half time, but um, I can definitely say if you have it um, a strategic decision, if you um, have everything, everyone on the board decide anonymously for this, saying this is, we are going for this. You have a much stronger position than being this one individual who jumps and says, look, there is actually no fair representation of women in this committee, or there should be that. And that is, was the most important thing to me, because then you can actually discuss it, negotiate it, and try to enforce it, remind people that it's it's important, you know, and, and point your fingers to the places where it's not already implemented. Overall, I can say we're having made a good progress, but, you know, the, the, the conversation is ongoing. I'm in, in some meetings, in some events where I'm extremely happy, and there's other where I think there's um, still potential to develop. Um, and it's a role that's not like with this initiation of that uh, 25, 25 strategy, which um, I was bringing to the SIGMM community, 
that it um, needs a constant monitoring and a constant encouragement and a constant um, communication with people how important this is uh, for our community. But it was, um, I think, excellent uh, to do. And I'm uh, looking forward to the more or less midterm report next year. And then, of course, sometimes look back in 2025 and see if the goals have been reached. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Miriam and Susan. Uh, very useful, informative, and you were perfectly on time, so <laughs> you cannot do better. Okay, so we move now to our next speaker. So Eleanor Drage, yeah, hi, hi Eleanor. Uh, welcome to the event and thanks for uh, accepting the invitation. So Eleanor is a, a Christiana Gauv postdoctoral research working on the Gender and Technology Research Project at the University of Cambridge at the Center for Gender Studies and in association with the Leverhulme Center Centre for Future Intelligence. So uh, we really look forward to hear your presentation. Eleanor is particularly interested in application of peer anti-racist and international intersectional methodologies to technological processes and systems. So thanks again. Today she's presenting her talk entitled Does AI remove discrimination in recruitment? Very interesting question and your approach for gender and anti-racist studies. The floor is yours. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a, it's a real pleasure. And again, I'm like uh, Mary, I'm very sad I can't be there in person. Um, this is a little bit different to what we've been discussing so far. Um, and I'll, I'll explain exactly what I'm going to talk about. Um, but I'm looking at how anti-racist and feminist theory and methodology can be implemented in practice at industry level to combat some serious issues in AI at the moment. So I will share my screen. Is that all right? Can you see? Yes. Great. Um, so, as was said in the very kind introduction, I'm a Christina Gore postdoctoral researcher in gender and technology. I'm based between two research centers at Cambridge, the Center for Gender Studies and the Center for the Future of Intelligence, which is an AI institute. I will move that to the side. Um, and most of this is, is based around the field work that I'm doing with my colleague, Kerry Mackrath, um, as part of the Gender and Technology Project. The key question that guides our industry partnership and that I'll explore in more detail is how can feminist and anti-racist studies be mobilized at industry level to shake up ethics work in AI? And I'm particularly looking at, at ethics work because what we're seeing at the moment is a lot of ethics washing. Everyone has an ethics committee. Um, everyone from PwC to IBM have um, issues kind of you know, ethics documents and, and committees that are trying to solve various problems. So we're, what we're doing in particular is we're collaborating with a technology multinational. They're as big as Facebook, um, so a massive, co massive company. And we're, we're collecting data on how employees perceive the relationship between company culture, key performance indicators, uh, diversity and inclusion initiatives, and the kinds of AI that they're developing and deploying. So they build loads of AIs in-house and they also uh, deploy third-party systems. So we're asking questions like, what's the relationship between diversity and inclusion um, initiatives organization-wide and the development of ethical technology? Because these are two things that practitioners seem not to see as linked, right? So the DNI stuff happens somewhere else um, and building ethical technology is something that is only relevant to particular systems. So there's this big gap between those two things. We've conducted about 70 interviews with employees across the organization and at different levels of seniority, including engineers, lawyers, uh, and staff from recruitment, skills and careers and marketing teams. And so we've been asking people about what they believe to be the benefits and the limitation of shiny new hiring tools that use AI. And one of the most interesting things about working with such a massive company that uses a vast amount of AI products for very different ends is the diversity of perceptions around AI, around what it can achieve, where it might not be useful, how people define AI, which systems and data people think might throw up ethical issues and equally 
which systems and data people believe to be supra-ethical, so beyond the realm of ethics. My colleague Kerry and I also host a podcast called The Good Robot, where we discuss some of these issues, and it explores what feminist work is doing in AI right now. We define feminism expansively, so it includes everyone's conceptions of what they believe to be feminist work in technology, like Buddhist and indigenous knowledges. So do check that out. Right, so today I'm going to share a brief overview of my research into AI hiring tools. So this paper takes a closer look at AI hiring tools, in particular the ones that claim that their products help remove bias or de-bias the hiring process in some way. So I set their strategies for doing this in conversation with work from gender studies and critical race theory. In particular, I look at what these tools claim to do with categorizations and classifications, particularly in relation to what they understand to be the protected attributes of race and gender. I argue that attempting to remove racial and gender difference between people using, for example, as you can see here on the screen, Big Five, the Big Five personality assessment, which is a kind of psychological assessment. Um, and here is my interview um, who are using it in order to, as they claim, de-bias the hiring process. But I, I argue that using gender and anti-racist theory, we can understand that this um, approach is potentially relying on a misunderstanding of what race and gender actually are, how they're produced and embodied in the hiring process. Hiring tools could better contribute to a more justice-driven approach by being instead attentive to how difference and discrimination is produced throughout the entire hiring pipeline. And here's an example of another hiring AI website that claims that AI can de-bias the hiring process by using this big five personality model to hire people based not on race and gender as they see it, but on personality traits alone. So why are people using these tools? Well, as many of you may know, HR practitioners are desperate for software that reduces agency spend and cuts down the pool of applicants that merit personal attention. This frees up some more time to engage with applicants in person. So imagine you're working for a company of 100,000 people. Many of you may have been in this situation and you're receiving tens of thousands of applications. How do you get through them? Who do you meet in person? Well, if you meet a kind of a technology that says, oh, you can, you can, uh, we can do this for you. We can get rid of loads of people and then you can be given a kind of select group of the best possible applicants. But recruitment stakeholders often have quite a limited understanding of how these tools actually work. They want to know just enough to be able to use them. And these technologies are extensively deployed with little regulation or guidelines, either from within the corporation or from external regulatory bodies. So I firstly look at Sensia, which is a hiring software that attempts to resolve bias issues by, and they say, stripping gender and race from its interface and backend, before looking at how video and transcription analysis AI technologies from my interview, Rotorio and Hireview, claim to reduce bias through personality assessments. So here, for example, we can see for a Hireview uh, advert, and you've got them pointing out what's good and what's wrong with an applicant on the screen. So while these hiring AIs that screen videos of applicants are more widely criticized for being surveillance and profiling, and you can probably see why, other forms of classification and hiring technologies can also be harmful. And this is partly because of the emergence of hiring tools within histories of gender and racial violence. And I'm going to explain briefly what that heritage is and why it matters. So we should remember that scientific racism was actually practiced for the purpose of hiring in the early 20th century, when Catherine Blackford here on the left, who's the influential 19th century author of character analysis by the observational method, outlined what she calls a character analysis for human resources based at looking at images of applicants. And critics such as John West and Alexander Todorov have argued that this was essentially a combination of phrenology and eugenics. 
And they've drawn links between what we consider to be an employable subject today and these much longer histories of racist pseudoscience. Okay, so let's look at these issues in relation to today's hiring tools. So firstly, this is Sensia, the AI technology I was talking to you about a little bit before, which is a talent intelligence platform that aims to, as I said, strip bias from the recruitment process by building in what it calls an anonymous mode into the platform. And it claims that by doing this, it removes bias identifiers like gender, ethnicity, age, race, and sexual orientation from a candidate's profile or resume. And in an interview, the CEO, uh, Joe Riley, said that this mode takes away any of those bias identifiers, not just stripping on the back end when we do a match, but stripping down the front end. So some interesting language there. However, there's obviously very little information online about how exactly Sensia does this, which makes it tricky to ask the question of how exactly does the anonymous mode not see race and gender? The other thing worth noting here is that in their marketing material, they don't address the potential for proxies of race and gender that may feature in the system. I'm not going to go into that, and instead I'm going to explore how critical race theory and queer of colour critique can help us understand why the attempt to effectively erase gender and race from the system is grounded in, as I said before, a misunderstanding of what systems and race and gender are and how they inform and are configured within the hiring process. So Sensia's implicit claim is that personhood can be separated out from gendered and racialized traits because gender and race are mere layers of dehumanization that are overlaid onto bodies which are, according to them, underneath it all, just human. My colleague Kerry Mackrath says that this logic prompts the attempt at an excavation or rediscovery of the human hidden within the racialized and gendered subhuman. So what does this mean then for their claim to strip race from a system to remove difference altogether? Can difference be removed in the attempt to transfigure all candidates into these kinds of equal people, stick men, into neutral data points? Might this just be the easy way out from the complex, slow, difficult task of making industries more diverse and more inclusive? Well, this desire to transform humans into neutral data points reminds me of something that Bell Hooks, who if you don't know her, is the American author, feminist and activist, and something that she said of her students, preferring to emphasize the common humanity of all people and promote ideas of sameness rather than different. Hook said of her students that often their rage erupts because they believe that all ways of looking that highlight difference to subvert the liberal belief in universal subjectivity, so the idea that we are all just people, that they think will make racism disappear. She says that her students have a deep emotional investment in the myth of sameness even as their actions reflect the primacy of whiteness as a sign of informing who they are and how they think. So we can say that Sensia appears to mimic this investment in sameness when creating an HR system that is devoid of the discomfort of having to actually grapple with how applicants are racialized and gendered. But does it actually erase race and gender to the point where, as they claim, all candidates will be treated equally just because the HR operative cannot see their race and gender? Would this approach actually work? Or does it imitate a colorblind logic that makes it easier not to deal with the complex problem of why bodies emerge as racialized and gendered? Instead, suspending bodies somewhere between visibility and invisibility. And can structural discrimination be reduced to a single bigoted human operative that has access to ethnicity data? Well, it would be far too easy to assume that the hiring process is sexist and racist merely because of individual hiring managers. And here we can turn to Cheryl Harris, who is a critical race theorist and professor of civil rights and civil liberties. 
who says that to understand racism as the problem of a few individual bigots would be to understand systemic injustice as merely the product of, and I quote, the irrational behavior of self-declared racial bigots who are few and far between, end of quote. So she concludes that, and I quote again, structural conditions, not just self-declared bigots, work to reproduce material quantifiable racial equality, inequality. So we need, I think, a different understanding of how recruitment AI figures within systems of race and gender through their construction of ideal candidate profiles. And we can, I think, see the problem with this here. Another example of recruitment AI that attempts to use categorizations to resolve bias issues can be found in video AI hiring technologies like I showed you before, that use these personality categorizations instead of gender or ethnicity classifications. And they view this as a way to provide a neutral assessment of a candidate's aptitude and suitability for the job. So this is my interview, who say that their assessments are bias-free because each video is analyzed for soft skills, personality traits, and keywords so you can tell which candidates match your company vibe, and this is in their language, while reducing the risk of bias from entering the picture. So the language of this marketing material mimics how the product allows HR practitioners to evade doing the incredibly uncomfortable work of grappling with how systems of race and gender come to bear in an HR system. It uses the language of risk and bias instead of the uncomfortable and potentially off-putting language of the experience of racist and sexist discrimination. The implication of their claim, I think, is that the system is unbiased because it only sees personality, skills and keywords, which apparently cannot be gendered or racialized at all. Systems of race and gender, therefore, allegedly have little to nothing to do with how personality and suitability are assessed which can be read as a convenient avoidance of, in Bell Hook's words, attending to racial and gender difference. So as political theorist Iris Young here on the right has argued, and I quote, the inclusion and participation of everyone in social and political institutions, therefore sometimes requires the articulation of special rights that attend to group differences in order to undermine oppression and disadvantage. End of quote. And what I think she means by this is that you can only create practical mechanisms that support the needs of different groups if your eyes are actually open. Colorblind casting in film and TV, for example, to take a different area, doesn't contribute to the better representation of diverse communities. And as the art journalist here on the left, Diep Tran, who specializes in diversity and the ethics of representation, has said, colorblind casting is dangerous in the same way as the phrase I don't see race is dangerous. She says, it negates the very real structural hindrances that block actors of color from the same opportunities as white actors. So what does colorblind hiring mean as part of a similar attempt to bypass structural racism and sexism at industry level? Well, we need our eyes to be wide open to see that the attribution of value laden personality traits is not distinct from systems of race and gender. People are classified and categorized on the job market in ways that ascribe to how hegemonic systems dominate by discriminating. Stephanie Smallwood notes that on the job market, and I quote, the logic of commodification secures particular ways of seeing, evaluating, classifying and representing things that emphasized fixed, uniform, stable characteristics so as to render their commensurability self-evident and thereby facilitate their easy circulation and exchange as commodities in the market economy. So characteristics that are desirable on the job market are never universally and objectively possessed by an applicant. They are always contextual and mediated by racialized and gendered ways of reading the body. So while my interview claims that its results are self-evident because, and I quote, 
algorithms are used to interpret body language and automated transcriptions and help give big five personality characteristics such as outgoing or altruistic, end of quote, we must remember that social bonds inform a system's perception of personality. And we must ask how social relationality is being obscured in these claims that an algorithm can objectively interpret how a candidate's interview corresponds to the big five psychology assessment. The assumption is that observations can be made without the observer impacting the values that are attributed or that the subject of identification, so the applicant, is distinguishable from the process of identification itself. And this is a premise that feminist physicist Karen Barrett here on the left, who's written this remarkable book, Meeting the Universe Halfway, that I really recommend, uh, has disproved. And she draws on quantum physics, particularly the work of Niels Bohr, to argue that the universe materializes differently according to the apparatus used by the observer. We can also turn here to Stuart Hall's representations, um, which is fantastic work that discusses how children learn to navigate linguistic and cultural systems by learning the system and the conventions of representation and the codes of their language and culture. And this equips them with a cultural know-how that enables them to function as culturally competent subjects. And he says they unconsciously internalize the codes which allow them to express certain concepts and ideas through their systems of representation, writing, speech, gesture, visualization, and so on, and to interpret ideas which are communicated to them using the same systems. So while the, interview, the algorithms that my interview use to interpret the words, phrases, and bodies of the candidates are proprietary, we can, we can, with Hall's research in mind, still say that the personality of the candidate always emerges in relation to the algorithm's determination of culture fit, a term that has been used for decades as a euphemism to justify the gendered and racialized exclusivity of working groups. So hiring AI's determination of a candidate's motions and keywords, the way we move, how we speak, are mapped onto existing configurations of culturally contingent behavior and linguistic norms and a predefined and quantified ideal successful employee that reflects the current workforce and mimics the hierarchies of racialized capitalism. So this categorical determinism or taxonomic mapping is also visible in the marketing materials of another hiring tool. This is Rotorio, and they use some software called Faced Reader Online in conjunction with, again, the big five or five factor model to show how, and I quote, individual characteristics of thoughts, emotions and behavior can be mapped in a taxonomy, end of quote. So the implication is that this taxonomy is detached from any particular context environment or set of candidates. And therefore, their service is scalable and replicable. You can use it anywhere on the world, on any pool of candidates, and it can therefore be sold widely. So on a side note, this is in February 2021, some journalists at the Bavarian Broadcasting um, in Munich put a dent to this claim by demonstrating how, bizarrely, wearing glasses and a headscarf in the, video, in the video interview actually decreases a candidate's score for conscientiousness and neuroticism. So that depends on literally what you're wearing on your face. The system's way of ascribing value to a candidate's self-presentation therefore corresponds tangentially at best with the big five. And the most established video hiring AI hire view is actually no longer building features derived from visual data so data from a video that a candidate uploads into its models following an audit by Kathy, the Cathy O'Neill Risk Consulting and Algorithmic Auditing Group. And this is O'Neill on the left, um, who's the author of Weapons of Mass Destruction. But they still use AI to map, map, to map a candidate's recorded responses against the big five. And these responses are then interpreted by the system in relation to a company's hiring interests which as I said before, will have been discussed with an account manager and then translated into a personalized assessment. And the answers that a candidate gives 
are therefore graded against the normative expectation of the company. So in the paper, I say a bit more about how queer theory from example, for example, Judith Butler shows that making hiring recommendations based on common keywords, personality traits and culture fit creates what we might call universal normatives, as in it maps applicants against a predefined view of the hiring context. But as I know we're short on time, I'll end here and return to my original questions. Are race and gender isolatable attributes that can be stripped or made absent from hiring platforms? Do they follow through with their claim to make all candidates equal, either through an anonymous mode or by focusing only on personality and skills? Well, these approaches are severely limited and they're bereft of a proper understanding of how a person emerges as employable or unemployable via normative systems. So to queer classifications, which is what we might call this, is to denaturalize and contextualize the categorizations that are used in recruitment AI. And our goal must be to engage with, rather than turn away from, how difference is iteratively inscribed in the bodies and language of candidates who are now increasingly exposed to this software. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eleanor. That was uh, very interesting. And I have um, also a few questions about that. So let's hope we, we will have a lot of discussion. Um, so the next speaker is uh, Joanna Perker. So thank you also, Joanna, for um, accepting the invitation. Uh, Joanna is an associate professor for game and development at TU Grass. So she is a computer scientist focused on game development, research, education, and active and strong voice of the local indie dev community. Joanna was also listed on Forbes 30 under 30, so really good achievement uh, for the science and professionals. She has been working uh, widely on uh, designing and developing games and VR experience, so quite in line with, uh, with also the MMC's conference, and uh, believes in these tools to support the learning and collaboration and solving problems. That's a perfect introduction to this talk of games as a game changer. Joanna, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for this kind introduction and the kind invitation to the event. I hope you can already see my screen and everything yes. works. Yeah. Um, so I'm super excited to talk about yeah, the, the thing I really adore in my life um, um, in this talk, which are games and game development. Um, but as many of you might know, um, games and the game development process are coming, especially if we talk about equality, diversity and inclusion, do have really good headlines sometimes and really terrible headlines sometimes. Um, just a few keywords, which I will not tackle in my talk, such as gamer. Um, Gamergate, um, we also had our Me Too movement in the female game developers community, and there's a lot of stuff going on, which is um, sometimes a little bit worrying. Um, I want to use this talk to tackle some of those topics, um, but again, it's the first time also that I give this sort of a talk um, at the conference, and I just want to give a broad overview, and I'm very happy about more discussions in the end. And as, I mean, I think that the game industry um, already comes with a lot of um, prejudices and um, stereotypes. I think this is already the best picture to describe that. Um, so if you think of a typical gamer, what is in your head? And I would say most of the people immediately think of this boy sitting in a basement, maybe full of pimples, <laughs> eating pizza all night long and playing video games. Um, but this is not true. This is like already like mistake number one, because I am a gamer. I am female, I am um, not, not 16, um, and I represent the target group. So if you look, for instance, at um, some statistics, the Entertainment Software Association is um, releasing every year statistics about the US market. There are like different market analysis worldwide though. But for the US market, we can already see the average video game player is actually 31 years old. And it's... Um, 55% would identify as male and 45% identify as female. So this is a lot of female players. We'd love to play video games as well. Maybe the um, sort of games or the platforms might be different, um, but we are very big market and should not be tackled as minority in games. 
Um, and just a little bit of a side note, um, when I was um, studying at MIT, when I was, I, I was super young and um, I met this very known, renowned physicist at MIT. He was um, like 70 years old and I introduced myself like this very young student and hello, my name is Johanna. I'm a, I'm a game designer. <laughs> and he was like, oh, I hate video games. I hate video games like Super Mario because the physics is all wrong. I only play games like Skyrim where I can ride my horse and fight the dragons with all the perfect physics all around me. So you never know who are actually um, the gamers and it can be your professor, but of course um, also your child. Um, so we need to be aware of the different target groups. And I really want to point out the games industry, I mean, I think as we all know, in, <laughs> which which is an important part of this conference, is not a small industry. These headlines are from, from many years ago, from 2014, for the first time when video games were outperforming Hollywood. But now the video games um, industry is making more money than the um, streaming industry, online books, online movies, um, music industry combined. And, and this is something we really need to, to, to think of because this is the medium, medium which is so interesting for not only our generation but especially also for the coming generations and the way how we shape the games now. This will really also shape how um, our children and our people are now understanding the environments. Um, th these are pictures not of people watching other soccer players or, or watching watching a nice football game. This is a stadium full filled with people watching others play video games. So this is really something we need to consider and take seriously. And I found for me, the game development industry itself, the game development process itself is one of the most interesting and diverse ones it could be. Because just think of a game like Assassin's Creed. Assassin's Creed is a game where you're in a, this historic setting um, and you, you are playing an assassin and you need to um, do assassin stuff. Um, but basically the main idea is for, for a game like this, it's not only programmers working together, it's people from all industries, from art, musicians, composers, story writers, historians in this case. So it's a very, very interdisciplinary field and super exciting to work together with people from all different fields um, and eventually like also in a very international setting. And this makes video games also very interesting topic wise because video games similar to movies can really strongly tell stories from all different aspects. And especially in the last years, we had a strong indie movement. So more and more people can also create games with tools like Unity um, and, and, and Unreal without big teams behind them. So also smaller teams, um, teams with an art background or with an entirely only music background or history or archaeology background can tell the story. And I believe that especially through playing video games, I can learn something and that's where we're back to the topic of equality and inclusion, which is empathy. Because in a video game, I am part of the experience. In a movie, in a documentary, it is lovely to watch a documentary, I can learn. But it's so clear that th these are other people, right? But in a video game, I can be in the, f in the shoes of someone else. I can experience the world from a different perspective. And I just want to give you some examples. Um, for instance, this is the um, video game called Dead Dragon Cancer, um, which is a video game developed by Amy and Ryan Green. And they tell the story how they discovered that their baby boy, Joel, um, has cancer. And, and they try to, yeah, they try to tell their story how they struggled or fight this cancer, the dragon cancer. Um, through a video game. And you as a player, you're not only watching, you're part of this experience because you're walking with them. And this is really powerful for understanding, again, for empathy. Or in, in this game, um, this is a war game. And we tend to say, oh, wow, yeah, there are so many war games out there. 
Um, but in this case, the interesting part is, uh, maybe you can um, pull forward. You're not playing the war hero, but you're seeing the different side of war, namely the side of civilians. The civilians who are trying to just survive the war and you, you experience their side. And when I was playing that game, I was um, playing the, a male character and I was with, in this bunker with my wife. And all of, a sudden, all of a sudden she got sick and I knew I need to get her medicine for her to survive. So I went out and I found medicine, but it belonged to an old couple who also needed a medicine to survive. And all of a sudden the game forced me to make a decision. Should I take away the medicine from them in order to save my wife, which would basically mean killing them, or should I just go back and watch my wife die? So this is a really strong trigger to understand different points of views. Um, a game which um, is very, very close to my heart because it's an Austrian production is Path Out. And this one tells the story of a Syrian refugee who came to Austria and I mean, also in Austria, we had really strong issues with, with understanding and with uh, including this group of minorities. And it was super important that his story, Abdullah's story, was told. And he chose to tell his story through a video game, which looks really lovely on the one hand. But in the very beginning, um, you, you, you feel safe in the game. It looks really lovely with all the lovely graphics. But all of a sudden, you take a wrong road and you, f you get shot. And all of a sudden, Abdullah tells you with his video, oh, wow, if I would be as clumsy in real life as you are in my video game, then I would be dead in real life. Again, a very, very strong message to understand. Um, another really impressive game is Missing, which tells the story about the experience, lets the player experience actually um, what it is like to be trafficked in in the, into the world of prostitution, which is still a, such a big topic nobody talks about and so many people are not even aware of. And I think those are really strong games. And I, I believe these sorts of games help us to understand others and have the power to walk maybe a few hours in the shoes of, of others. Um, even more powerful are virtual reality experiences because with virtual reality experiences, you have this feeling of immersion, um, which means that you actually believe that you are in this um, um, scenario. And that's why it's already quite popular um, and, and often used in therapy such as um, post-traumatic stress um, disorder therapy or also to teach employees at Walmart how to talk with our customers. But um, it's also very important and very interesting to, again, understand the perspective of others. And there are really powerful experiences out there who lets you experience the world from, from a different gender. Or in this example, um, see the world through the perspective of it's, it's traveling while back, black. And you see the world and how people react to you from a different perspective if you would be a different person if you would have a different gender if you would have a different race and i think it's so important for people to understand actually different struggles other people might never experience even in daily life so um i i, I think games and um vr experience in general have are really powerful tools um, to help us understand others. And especially in the, in the topic of developing more experiences, um, tackling the topics of equality, diversity, and inclusion, this can be really powerful tools. Um, but for the, for the last part of my talk, I would like to tackle an entirely different top, um, topic, which is a little bit the game developer's perspective. So um, I already mentioned, like I, I'm a gamer, I love playing video games, but I also became a video game developer. So how, How's that? And I want to tell you a little bit of a backstory. So my computer, uh, my background is actually computer science, and also in computer science, it's it's. I mean, this is this is something which is really worrying because actually the number of um, computer science graduates and starters is not growing. It's either pretty much staying the same or sometimes even getting down. So if we look into the past. And we actually can see so many interesting female role models in computer science. 
Um, so I think if I show this picture, probably most of you are already like thinking of all the, the great achievements that have been um, um, achieved by in the past by, by female computer scientists, such as the first programming language. Or, um, and yeah, it's, it's really fantastic to see so many um, yeah, strong role models in the past and of course, when I was starting to or trying to start computer science, I was terrified as well because like while I was a student, I did not have one female professor, for instance, um, during my studies, which is, of course, worrying because we tend to need role models at some point. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and I a little bit to my backstory. So also as a child, um, I was like a really passionate gamer. I just show you these pictures. So I'm not sitting in front of the computer all day long, still not. But also back then, um, I really started playing video games really early. So the first game I played, maybe some of you might know this one, was Prince of Persia on a DOS machine. I was probably like three years old. Um, I, I was not able to to read or write yet, but I knew on the, on the DOS machine of my, my father what do I need to enter there in order to start that game? So you're playing this prince to save the princess. And if I look back to all the games which I love to play, Super Mario, Zelda, Aladdin, later Assassin's Creed, it's somehow always strong male characters saving the princess. And this is something which is like a little bit in retrospect, a little bit worrying. And also if I look back into, like if you look at the top seven gaming franchise um, ever sold, which have more than 100 million copies sold, Mario, We Save a Princess, Tetris is a puzzle game, Call of Duty, very, very male driven, Super Mario, We Save a Princess, Pokemon, male character Ash, GTA, um, no words needed, FIFA, um, there was no female, um, so, so, soccer teams until very recently um, and I yeah, have no words for, for what else we, we experienced in the past and what we can see that I mean I was very inspired because I thought okay hi I have this cool world and yes I am playing this this prince to save the princess but it is actually me playing it and it really inspired me to also like try to create those worlds myself and eventually also add my own perspectives to it. So I found that computer science is really colorful. Um, yeah, no, okay, this was maybe a bad joke, but um, for me, computer science and programming was really colorful because behind those lines of code, there was my, my creativity because computer science um, is often, if, how they teach it sometimes, it, 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 it sounds boring and it sounds frustrating, but in the, it, the truth is for me, it's my form of art because I would love to draw really well or love to write really well, but I can't. But what I can do with programming and programming video games, I can create three dimensional worlds or everything which is in my head and people can actually visit my thoughts and interact with my personal world and and this is super super interesting but um what we also see like it's super important that also the development process becomes more diverse and um, because as we saw in the past um where a lot of games had really strong male characters and now more and more games are having really strong female characters because more diversity is added and i it's often that not that the studios did not want to add diversity because, but it was just missing because similar, like we had the discussions before in the previous talks, if the, the team is not diverse, people might try, just miss, oh, hey, this might be a little bit sexist or, hey, this might not work for colorblind people or, hey, this, this control is not really accessible for, for other users. But if you add different points of view, different lenses to your team, it can really also positively reflect in your games. Um, so I, I think, um, especially this lack of diversity in, in game studios and inclusive development and um, hiring process um, is something which is really important. There are fantastic resources out there such as the game accessibility guidelines to make 
games more inclusive for people with handicaps or also supportive hiring programs like like gaming creator program from facebook and i think more and more of those initiatives um should be supported and last and but not least um what really helped me personally to see the the world of games from a different perspective because i also as you saw in this list I tended to play always the same games with the same stories and similar characters. Um, but I, I, I try to get out of my comfort zone. And in this project, a year of playing the world, I try to find games from all countries of, of the world and play those games. And playing games from Zambia versus playing games, the, the typical triple A games we already know, can really also um, yes, um, see different lenses. So thank you so much, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Joanna. Very, very interesting and also interesting connection with the previous talk, still kind of related to hiring and diversity, but from a different perspective. So that was very interesting. Uh, and we, we have now our last speaker, which is on site, I believe. So I will introduce uh, the speaker and then um, uh, we will have streamed directly from Istanbul. So Dr. Alper uh, as is a cognitive scientist and works as an assistant professor of psychology at Ozejin University. So um, he is uh, currently serving as the department chair there. And uh, let's say that in being keen um, in having or showing interest in tackling the different forms of inequity and discrimination in society, he uh, was then introduced to the Institutional Gender Equality Planning in the academia by the Plotina Project, and this is what he's going to talk about today. So, thanks. Thank you very much for this very... Oh, sorry, I thought... Are you finished? I couldn't follow the last part. Thank you very much for the very yes. kind introduction. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Alper Açık. Uh, I'm a cognitive scientist working at the psychology department of Özin University, Özin University, and I know that there are some of you who are also working at the uh, same university. So today we are. I'm going to talk about an uh, EC-funded project that we have completed in 2020. The name of the project was Plotina, and Plotina is an acronym for uh, promoting gender balance and inclusion in research, innovation, and uh, training. So as I have just said, here we are talking about an uh, Horizon 2020 framework project. Within that framework, you had the objective science for and with society. And one of the specific calls within that objective was Jerry, gender equality in research and innovation. And uh, within that call, you could uh, receive uh, uh, a grant for an international uh, consortium in the European research area in order to support research organizations to implement a tailor-made uh, gender equality plans. And this is exactly what we have done. Our coordinator was the University of Bologna. We were a relatively small partner in terms of our responsibilities and in terms of the uh, budget that was allocated to us. And of of course, uh, you are uh, familiar with this, I'm sure, uh, in such uh, consortiums. Usually, our uh, research uh, funding or research producing organizations, they collaborate with SMIs, small to medium enterprises. And these enterprises typically either take care of the dissemination work of the project or they are involved in providing coaching and consultancy. They may be running your web page, they may be controlling your social media accounts, etc., etc. And in this list here, you first see the research. Uh, performing organizations together with the National Institute of Chemistry in Ljubljana, uh, Slovenia. They were also a research funding organization. And uh, at the bottom, you see the uh, SMIs, and they were helping us to uh, develop our own gender equality plans, to uh, implement the actions that belong to our uh, gender equality plans, and they were also in charge of uh, dissemination. So uh, 
Glutina is not a unique project because as we have just seen, there is a specific call and within that call, there is a specific item that allows the research performing organizations to uh, meet with uh, SMIs in order to uh, support the implementation process of a tailor-made uh, gender equality plan. Accordingly, there were many projects uh, and there are still many projects very similar to Plotina, Genova, Generate, Agera, Libra are just some of the first names that uh, come to my mind. And here what you do is actually pretty standard, you know. So first you have to understand the status of gender equality or the lack thereof at your institution and for that you run a gender audit. You use the outcome, you use the results of that gender audit which has a quantitative analysis part and qualitative analysis part for the design of your tailor-made uh, JEP, which would be the phase two. And then, of course, you start implementing the JEP. So the development of the JEP uh, is the easy part, of course. And what do we mean with a gender equality plan? Well, of course, we can think of different domains in which you can address gender equality. And I'm going to show you in a second what I mean uh, by that. And finally, of course, you need to monitor your progress in implementing the actions that belong to your gender equality plan and you have to be evaluated. I just forgot to add that um, usually monitoring and evaluation is also a task that is allocated not to the uh, research performing or research funding organizations uh, in these types of consortiums, but again to the SMIs, to small to medium enterprises who specialize in monitoring and uh, evaluation. Here I just want to quickly show the Plotina Ozu team together with our coordinator Tulia, as I have said, our coordinators were based in Bologna and in these kinds of projects, good management, good coordination is so important. I didn't have uh, experience in these types of EU projects, even though my PhD was also uh, funded by a European uh, research grant while I was still in Germany, but this was the first time I was directly involved in all aspects of a project of this type. And early on, we had situations that can qualify as a crisis. For instance, we had a very poor start into the project as a consortium. The first year was, was relatively unproductive and later we parted ways with one of our SMI partners and that partner had to be replaced by a new partner and you can imagine that uh, in a you know uh, EC funded project of this size with a large budget, changing partners in the middle of the project can be seen as a very bad sign but thanks to the uh, great uh, leadership of Tulia and thanks to the uh, managerial skills of the whole Bologna team, uh, such uh, problems uh, were uh, solved rather easily and obstacles were uh, overcome. So uh, how about our university? As I have said, I'm not going to talk about uh, a detailed analysis of the impact of this project, but I'm going to focus on the experience of uh, having and running this project at our university. So here I have a couple of statistics about our university. Erzien University is a young and research-oriented foundation university. This means that uh, even though it's a uh, not-for-profit organization, most of the students at the university have to pay their fees. But uh, of course, uh, it's also uh, one of the more accessible ones and uh, according to the 2020 statistics, the average uh, scholarship uh, a student was receiving at our university was I think around 50 uh, percent. So it's an international university. Most of the programs are uh, fully in English. Uh, we attract quite a bit of international students from different uh, geographical regions. And uh, here you can see I think the um, the change in the numbers of the students and the change in the numbers of the employees from 2008 to 2018. And as you can see, very young university, ambitious uh, university, trying to attract the best students in Turkey and elsewhere, trying to attract the uh, most prolific uh, researchers, etc., etc. And now today, uh, or let's say, uh, 
six months ago was the last time I checked it. Uh, our university has become one of the six universities in Turkey that, is implement, that has implemented a gender equality plan. Considering that there are more than 200 universities in Turkey alone, uh, I think this is uh, rather impressive. And this plan was developed and uh, implemented in the context of this uh, Plotina project and uh, this is why I am uh, sharing with you today uh, what we have done uh, in terms of the Plotina project at our university. So uh, after you have your uh, gender audit and this gender audit requires you to collect both quantitative and qualitative data at your institution. So you look at numbers, of course, how many uh, male academics do you have how many female academics do you have, the numbers of students, etc., uh, the number of the uh, active projects or research projects at the university where gender is a significant factor, or the uh, representation of gender in the cor course curricula, these were all analyzed. But I think what was even more important was qualitative data. Uh, at the very beginning of the Plotina project, uh, me and my colleagues, which I have just uh, shown to you, uh, we we have run a lot of focus groups with the depart different administrative and academic units of the university. We would invite sometimes five people, six people, seven people, and we would just ask them open-ended questions like, you know, okay, uh, say it is the law faculty or the engineering faculty. Uh, do the students encounter the notion of gender in any of their lectures? What do you think about it? Or is there room for improvement? Or is there uh, gender-based discrimination that you have encountered in your department or in your unit? Or if someone uh, goes for a if someone is uh, on a maternal leave, let's say, what does your department do once they return? So these are some of the data we have analyzed. And if you want to hear about the experience itself, well, I think we, as the Plotina team at Esdian University, we're not really ready to run those focus groups because once uh, we have started with the focus groups, people had so much to tell us, you know, and we, we really started to feel, well, maybe we should, you know, find some professionals to do that because the people have so much to share about the status of gender equality in different domains in their uh, area of expertise, in their uh, faculty or in their administrative unit. And every now and then, of course, you would find a uh, person uh, in a managerial position in a unit telling you this and that, and then you would also talk to the uh, other employees of that unit. These can be academics, they can be administrative personnel, and you would observe a large discrepancy from, uh, between what you hear from the manager and what you hear from the uh, other employees of that unit. Our gender equality plan uh, had five key areas. Governance, like the uh, gender composition of decision-making bodies, the mechanisms that exist in order to support especially early career researchers. Why is that important? Because you probably know that if you compare the uh, numbers of uh, men and women at different uh, academic levels, when you look at, for instance, at PhD students or when you look at recent PhD graduates, you usually look at an equity. So the numbers are quite comparable between men and women. But when you move up in the uh, academic hierarchy, when you go to assistant professors, to associate professors, to full professors, you see that the number of uh, women usually goes down in most disciplines, especially in STEM disciplines like, you know, science, technology, engineering, math, etc. Work-life integration, uh, gender and sex as important variables in all kinds of research, not just in uh, biological research, not just in social science research, but uh, all areas. So if you're building uh, maybe a rescue robot, for instance, uh, is the rescue go robot going to talk? And if the rescue robot is going to talk, is it going to talk with a male voice or female voice? Did you take that into account? Did you run tests in order to understand that a little bit better, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And of course, we were also uh, interested in uh, 
how gender was represented in the curricula of different uh, departments. So at the beginning, we have encountered both challenges, but we also had important opportunities that helped us. So when it comes to the challenges, well, we found it difficult to learn the correct language to convince people that we were doing something good for the university. Because uh, when you first say, start to talk about gender equality, we have noticed that people were thinking that this was going to introduce a direct deviation from meritocracy. Because uh, when they heard gender equality, they would think of directly positive discrimination, even though this was not a notion that was used by us, the Plotina team at our university. So we have realized that positive discrimination as a notion has a bad reputation. Uh, and it was not like uh, we needed that uh, concept to uh, introduce the kinds of the measures that, uh, or the kinds of the actions that we had uh, in our gender uh, equality plans. So we first had to convince people that what we are trying to do is not at odds with meritocracy, just the other way around. There are missed opportunities, there is wasted talent because of the sexist environment that we occupy and the uh, career chances of the uh, women scientists it is not as straightforward as the career paths of uh, men scientists and slowly we were able to you know convince the people we were uh, using our words and phrases uh, with equal opportunities in it empowerment in it, capacity building, and that was okay. And of course, you need to recruit people because you have to be really passionate about these kinds of projects because you are losing a lot of your time that you could use for your own research in order to improve your teaching. But these projects are not research projects, but rather transformative projects. You try to change the culture of your institution with the plan that you develop and that you uh, implement. And as such, you also need uh, allies. You need to collaborate with other members of the institution. And of course, they are very busy people. They have teaching duties, they have research projects, and of course, they have existing uh, administrative uh, duties. Of course, you are influenced by national politics. When you look at the last five, six years uh, of Turkey, you are going to observe immediately drastic changes in gender-related uh, policies. You may have heard about the Istanbul Convention. You may have heard about the rising anti-LGBTQ plus rhetoric in Turkey. And this also influences how you deal uh, with your uh, problems at the level of the institution because in Turkey uh, the level of academic autonomy, academic freedoms, it is limited, right? You are controlled by the Higher Education Council and the uh, government policies can directly have an influence on what can be done or what cannot be done at your uh, university. So you also have to deal with these kinds of challenges. But we also had opportunities. We had a rector who is a woman, uh, Esra against her and she was very supportive. We were a very young university, meaning that we could still shape the culture of the university. It was a less traditional university with a universal outlook, and these were all factors that helped us a lot. We already had an in informal network of academics at our university focusing on gender, um, mainly social scientists together with some uh, law academics. Um, we were able to combine different kinds of experience in our uh, project team. We had experience in academia, civil society, private sector, etc. That was also uh, very useful. I will come back to that in a second, but that we had very active uh, accreditation and quality assurance efforts at our university was also uh, to our advantage. And, uh, 
uh, I will explain in a second why. So we were learning basically from our experience. We were learning the language and the arguments to use in order to resist the resistance to change, if you like. We were also becoming familiar with the corporate or the bureaucratic structure of a higher educa uh, education institution. And in these projects, this is inevitable. Initially, for instance, I personally didn't have much experience with running a, a higher education institute. But if you are intending to introduce cultural change, this is exactly what you need to do as well. Something uh, we have learned very early on is is you have to co-mobilize top-down and bottom-up processes. What do I mean by that? Just by recruiting your colleagues, you cannot uh, have a lasting change. And it's also not enough that the university management is going to dictate the gender policy or gender equality policy of the university. You have to recruit... Uh, of course, of course, ha of, of course. But everything has changed at our institution when the wave of the sustainable development goals reached our university. I remember in 2017 there was an email. We were asked, all of us were asked to, you know, provide a description of our projects in relation to the SDGs, and nobody. Knew, had uh, heard about them. But as the Plotina team, we were speaking already the language of the sustainable development goals and we have become the focus of attention at our institution. Our institution, our university already had a sustainability focus and the increasing importance of the sustainable development goals helped us a lot. And our university has also become the world's top Turkish university in the uh, time cycle education impact uh, rankings in 2019, but it later dropped down further, but uh, we can maybe discuss these issues uh, later. But this project has become very valuable for our university, and the university was convinced that the implementation of a gender equality plan was extremely important because this approach was also generating resources and assets. I'm not saying that we were doing the project, we were running the project or trying to implement the gender equality plan for these resources or assets. But of course, if this is happening, if the universities are receiving awards for gender equality work, or if the university is rising up in the uh, rankings I have just mentioned, well, uh, you uh, are able to move more freely while trying to do uh, what you did. So what did we do? We have employed a gender equality expert, we formed a gender equality unit, and uh, we have provided gender awareness training for all the employees of the university. And here we didn't even use the resources of Plotina, but the university paid for these uh, trainings, uh, and this was a very important gain. Uh, and of course, we have also become part of other projects and collaborations in the same domain. Our rector uh, has become active in the European Women Rectors Association, where she also uh, presented our gender equality planning uh, with uh, pride, I can say. Okay, um, maybe uh, I can uh, stop uh, slowly here. Many of our gender equality efforts, they had to stall during the pandemic, but now we are back at the campus, so I think we can continue our valuable work. Uh, of course, after the finalization of a uh, age 2020 project, sustainability of gender equality uh, can be a problem, but uh, the remedy or the panacea is the institutionalization with a gender expert, with a gender equality unit, uh, we can sustain these efforts. Okay, maybe I stop here and uh, we can continue with the discussion. Sorry if it took too long.